Good morning, everyone. Welcome to an all-new edition of On the Mark here on Westfield Community Programming, Channel 15, 89.5 FM WSKB, and our media partners at Southwick Community Television and Agawa Media. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach, and we're in the studio today with a great group of people, and all of this was coordinated by Stefan Saporowski, who's the superintendent of the Westfield Public Schools, who has a program here on Thursdays called Superintendent. And it's spotlight, correct? Yes, we do. Yes, I do. And Stefan and I were talking, and he told me about one of the things that makes Westfield Technical Academy very special. It has an aviation program. Thanks to its proximity to Barnes Regional Airport in Westfield, Galen Wilson, who is the coordinator of that program, is here with two of his students, Kaylin and Owen. And we're going to talk about how people in at Westfield Technical Academy can learn to fly and learn to work in the aviation industry and make great money right after graduating high school. So welcome to all of you today. Thank you. Yeah, thank Happy you to be here. So, Stefan, tell me how this program came about. Well, that's about, I think, 10 years in the making now, right? So we... Uh, you know, I, I um, we came back here as principal in 2012, and um, we wanted we had space upstairs. We wanted to expand, uh, offer another program, and our general advisory chairman at the time was Ed Watson, and he had an airplane. And, he, and if you remember Ed Galen, I do, I do. And he, uh, you know, he was expressing frustration that he couldn't get his airplane fixed. <laughs> uh, he had to wait a certain amount of time because there was a wait list. He's like, "What about aviation for the tech?" And so we're like, "Hmm." Okay, so we, we took a ride to some other places, and everything was post-secondary, after high school. We went to New Hampshire, um, went to New York, check out some other schools, and then we decided to see if we could move forward, applied for some grants. The next year, we were fortunate enough to find uh, Chief Wilson to uh, join the program, and the rest is history. Here we are. Um, you know, it came together a large group effort of an advisory board of local folks that were really passionate about aviation uh, and wanted to get this off the ground. That was intentional. And then, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and I think our first class, so our first freshman class, entered in 2016. That was that first year. We had our first year of ninth graders. And now it's 2023. We've graduated. Several, several, uh, several classes, classes now. Yes. It's hard to believe. It's, it doesn't seem that long ago, does it? But, but uh, that's how the program started. And, and Galen brought it forward. And, and uh, he's been a tremendous asset to, our, to the school, to the program, and to really getting this, uh, getting this operational. Galen, how many programs like this exist in schools around the country? Or is Westville Tech the only place that has one? Uh, there, are, there are three FAA-certified high schools in the country, and Westfield's one of them. Uh, there are plenty of STEM programs where a high school have an aviation, uh, you know, introduction to aviation program, but they're not FAA certified. Westfield Technical Academy is FAA certified as part of 14 CFR, which stands for Code of Federal Regulation, and we are a 147 school. So, so fully blessed by the FAA, and like I said, only one of three in the country. That's terrific. And, and what does the program entail? Is it, uh, I mean, are, are the students still getting their academics while they're doing this, or are they specifically doing aviation-related uh, uh, you know, curriculum while they go to school? Uh, well, like all shops uh, at Westfield Technical Academy, they, the students have an academic piece, and then the next week they'll be in their shop, and aviation is set up the same way. So it's academics one week. We'll call it A week, and then B week would be shop. Uh, so we get them for six hours a day, five days a week. <laughs> Every other week, yeah. A month after. No, no, it's great. Love it. Love it. Absolutely love the job. Uh, love the students. Okay, and we have two students here. Um, Kaylin, what made you decide to get into aviation? So originally I came to Westfield Tech for construction because that's what my dad does. And awesome. after going through all of the one days, I really liked aviation. And my parents 
are best friends with the old number two at Gulfstream. And so he said that I should put aviation down as a one week. So I took aviation and I ended up loving it. And so I really tried to get in like really hard. And my parents were like, they have never actually seen me study <coughs> for something outside of school. And uh, during my one week, I was actually like reading and studying. <laughs> Yay. What year are you at Westfield Tech? A uh, senior. A senior. So when you graduate in May or June of 2024, will you go to college or will you go right into the industry? Um, I want to go to college and get my power plant license, which is like the next thing you can get after your airframe. So can, do you have your, are you flying now or, or is this in, in this program, are you learning more about how to fly, you know, the mechanics of flying? More like mechanics and fixing the airplanes and what to do and what not to do. Okay. And Owen, um, what brought you to the program? So... I've always been fascinated with aircraft, working with them, wanting to fly them ever since I can remember. Now, I started flying when I was in seventh grade. I'll never forget. It was February 7th of 2019. I, I, I remember it. I yeah, remember that's, it. yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I first started flying Air One with uh, Ken Drumgold, who told me about this program, Mr. Wilson's friend. Um, from there on, I knew I wanted to get in. I came. I uh, did a shadow day here. Just knew I wanted it. There was no other, like, plan B of a shop here. I wanted aviation. That was my number one. What year are you at Westfield Tech? Oh, I'm a senior. A senior. So yes. you're going to graduate. What Are you going to go to college, or are you going to go directly into the industry? No, I'm going to go to college. I want to fly. I have applied to the, the Naval Academy, and I got into Embry-Riddle. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations, Congratulations, by the way. Wow. That. That's Thank terrific. You. Embry-Riddle is one of the best uh, flying schools around. Yeah. Yep. So, Galen, what kind of careers – can students like these get right out of Westfield Tech? We, we typically see students track three different ways. They track the technical side, so working at Gulfstream on their state-of-the-art aircraft. Uh, they track the engineers. So we have many students that have gone on to WPI, RPI. One almost got into MIT, so close. Um, Purdue, Wichita State, Embry-Riddle. And the list of colleges is, is pretty long. And then the third track is pilots. And we have students, uh, we have one student now that is an American airline pilot. So... So, the, again, track three different ways. And those pilot tracks, they'll also go to Embry-Riddle. Um, we have one at the Air Force Academy now um, and uh, Bridgewater State. I mean, just a whole – just just many colleges out there that, uh, that offer a flying program. Kaylin and Owen, describe what a day – what your day in the aviation program is like. Are you in a classroom here? Are you out at Barnes Airport? Um, is it hands-on? Is it learning? So senior year, we spend most of our time out at the airport. So we have a shop and the classroom up here. So your first two years, we'll spend a lot of time up in the shop and at the classroom, you know, learning. Book work. <laughs> Lots of book work. But you're on this campus, right? Yes. Yeah. For, for your freshman, sophomore yes. year. And, but we do go to the hangar, part. too. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, and then? Senior year. So far, it's been all hangar, all hands-on work, senior and junior year. It's been all hands-on. Senior year, we do a lot more at the hangar because we also have the freshmen doing in-shop doing their one weeks. Right. So we try and stay away from them. <laughs> I guess that's how you do it. Because <laughs> they kind of they take up every single classroom here. Right. So it's easier for us to go out to the hangar right away do our two to three hours of book work in the morning with like a 15-ish minute break in between. Yeah. And then usually... 10 minute, 10 minute break. 10, ten, minute, <laughs> ten minute break. <laughs> well, and you know, you're clarifying that because the FAA <laughs> makes you account for every hour, don't they? Yes, they do. And so um, will you both be taking the FAA exam? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So was a lot of what you do preparing for that? Yes. Yeah. Like everything we do with the books is always applied to one of our aircraft. It's not just, you know, reading a book and you don't know what you're doing. You're going to go and you're going to do it yourself. And we have aircraft for you to work on. Yes. Yeah. How many how many planes do you have? We have 12 airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And, and these, um, and these <laughs> small. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> a dozen. Wow. A fleet. <laughs> we have a fleet. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, have you both of you have you been behind in the cockpit and actually taken flying lessons as part of this, or have you done it independently? I have done it independently, but we do have the opportunity to go up and fly with. Um, what was it like the first time? Uh, did it, you went with an instructor? I'm yeah. sure they just did. Yeah. Yeah. The oh yeah, no. <laughs> there you Check go. It out, no. No. you know. But um, what was it like the first time you were in there and actually in control? It was like surreal. I don't. Um, it's hard to put into words, to be yeah. honest. With it, you. It's really just like it's almost magical because <laughs> you're up there, and then you can like. It's so weird because you can see where the clouds are and like the shadows that they're leaving on the mm. ground. Like you're you're in control of the plane. It's like it becomes like I don't. This might sound corny, but like party. You know what I mean? It's like uh, I get oh, what you're doing. No, I, 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 I don't know how to. I like is the it, magic. Is, is it weird flying <laughs> over Westfield and saying, oh, "There's my house." And there's <laughs> school? Do you, do you do that when? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Because <laughs> I know the first time that I was on a flight coming into Bradley and it was flying over my house and it was a clear day. It was winter time and the leaves on the trees weren't blocking the view of everything. I saw my condo <laughs> and I saw the <laughs> Starbucks in Long Meadow and I went, wow, this is too cool. And there was Enfield Mall. And the next thing we know, I mean, I really could chart it the whole way. And for several years in my work, I commuted to Washington once a week on a plane okay. and I knew all the landmarks all the way down, and to fly over Manhattan mm. Uh, mm. at night was one of the most exciting visuals. It's stuck up in my head. Yeah. So for you, what's been the best experience flying? Um, I don't really have like a, a favorite, but uh, over the summer I did fly to California with just me and my brother to go see our cousins, and on our way back, when we flew out of Chicago for our layover, we actually got off of our flight path because there was a lightning storm. Hmm. And so we had to fly like up over Canada. And that was honestly, like, it was very cool because it was night. <coughs> so you could see like all of the, the lightning, lightning bolts and everything. That was like one of my favorites. What about you, Owen? Because you actually been uh, in the cockpit. Yeah, my favorite part, you know, stalls, maneuvers, stuff like that. Tight turns. Uh, um, I do want to learn more about like instrument flying and stuff. That's not something I haven't done. I don't have enough hours to get to that yet, but that's definitely something that interests me. When you when you fly commercially, since you know how it works mm -hmm. and everything, what do you watch when you're on a flight uh, commercially? I've only ever been on one commercial flight, and I was really young, so I <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't remember. But you you just came back uh, through Chicago and watched. Yeah. It. Um. Honestly, I watch every, like, just every little part of it. I mean, I get paranoid now when I fly because I'm like, uh, I don't know how trustworthy these people are now. And my favorite thing is, so I also flew to Florida in February, and the whole time we were, it, we had just gotten done with, like, flight instruments and stuff like that. So the whole way down, I would, every time they would, <coughs> do a maneuver or something like that. I was explaining to my poor cousin who was sitting next to me what they're doing and what that part was and all of, all of that. I will say this. Every, every person that I've met in the avi aviation industry, I'm, without exception, is very passionate about aviation. Have you found that as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. They love it, right? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so... When it comes to, and now, you know, what's interesting is because you were talking about flying in an airplanes, but now you know what makes the airplane work, at least on the outside, right? So with the uh, airframe, and now you want to go for your power plant part, which goes to the engine, and we want to expand the program to we include uh, the power plant piece. Would you, uh, and you said you're going back for that. You want that. Why do you want to have both? Um, airframe and power plant. Better pay. Okay, so, there you go. Yeah. So if you have your airframe, you'd get this amount of pay. But then if you have your power plant, you'd get even more amount from that. So it makes and you more marketable. Yeah, and it's more, more knowledge, too. Okay. A question for Galen. Um, you're preparing these students and young people to go out in the industry. What kind of jobs can they find around here uh, in the area if they choose to stay in Western Mass? 
Uh, well, there's, there, there are actually many. Um, you have Sikorsky, uh, Bombardier, um, Pratt & Whitney, uh, Pratt & Whitney Woods Group. Um, but our number one, number one uh, company that, that the students uh, uh, flock to, I want to say, is Gulfstream. Gulfstream supports this program. Uh, immensely, uh, Fran Ahern was the uh, uh, was the general manager over there, and uh, and and we had a great working relationship. I'd send him students on on internships, and uh, and 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 he greeted him with open arms. So, uh, Gulfstream, uh, we find a lot of students go to Gulfstream. I think we have seven or eight over there now. Well, I know, and there are some that go after school too, correct? If, and, and I think that, that's important. Um, Mr. Daly was telling us Right, that on, an on an internship. internship. Not co-op. We do not do co-op because of the amount of time um, that we need to spend in this program. And what, so what are the hour, there's an hourly requirement that students have to yes. achieve in order to be able to take that exam, correct? Um, so so work? a lot of that's changed. A lot of that's changed, but we didn't change. We did, we have the option to go competency based, and um, we opted to stay hourly based because we can control it a little better, right? Uh, and and we can track it a little better. So, so in general, um, there's actually two courses that the students need to take. They need to take the general course, which is 400 hours, and then the airframe. Which is seven hundred and fifty <coughs> hours, okay. and they must they must complete those hours in order to get certified to take the test. And what academics do they have to do in conjunction with it? Uh, so, <laughs> so we run them through we run them through uh, science, physics, math, math up to trig, but we do this in freshman year, so we 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 jam a lot of information. Um, you know their way, um, and and with hopes that they get it, and and they typically do, because we talked about it earlier. You know, in, in Zaporowski, you mentioned that that uh, um, you know people in aviation <laughs> have the passion. When we select students, we look for that passion. Grades are important, but the passion. If, if this is what you want, this is what you really want, you're coming to me after school and early in the morning and you're saying, I want aviation, I want aviation, that shows a passion. Um, so we look for that. Um, and also, interestingly enough, Mark, um, when the students graduate and they take their test, that's 30 college credits. Wow. So here, here you are, a senior, yeah. just graduated high school, and you have 30 college credits. If you... If you participate in the Promise program at, at Westfield, Westfield State. State University, we had one student at 18 credits, Jared Fournier. So he left here with 48 college credits and went to Wichita State and double majored in aeronautical engineer and uh, software engineer. Since this is one of three programs in the country, do you have to be a Westfield resident to attend and do this? Or if somebody in a contiguous town or in the area, a, one, a parent wanted their child to go into this program. Is it available to them? I mean, they can apply, right? So, and we have our, our exploratory process. So a student from another district can attend Westfield Tech if they want to take a program that, that we have that no other school offers, which is aviation in this particular case. Uh, so they can apply to come in. So they are eligible, but what it comes down to is, you know, there's with aviation, they have their one days and they have their one weeks. And there's an assessment that goes along with this process to make sure that the students um, have the aptitude to be able to do the work. And I think, you know, I, I know that doesn't sound great. You'd love to be able to open it up to everybody. But as people who fly, you want to, I mean, you have to have people that are able to do the math, the physics, and such that uh, Galen was referring to earlier. So uh, what we would love to see is adding in more instructors and adding and have the ability to take more students. So that's our plan moving forward because there is a shortage in the aviation field, whether it's mechanics, pilots, you name it. Uh, and it's only going to get worse as we, that was the other reason why we wanted this program was because we were meeting a need in our, in our world that, you know, uh, a lot of retirements are going to be happening, have happened already. And I, and I heard a number, one local company, you know, they have a 40% rate of, of vacancies. 
And so, you know, so you're, as we fly, oh, why is there a delay, right? Well, if there's no one to work on those aircraft, you're going to experience delays, right? If there are no pilots to fly these planes, you're going to experience delays. And so, you know, fulfilling a need while giving a student a meaningful career is what we want to do. And, and if we, when we can take more, we'll be more than happy to do that. What does the um, proximity to Westfield Barnes Airport have to do with this program? Could you do this program without Barnes, or is uh, Barnes an important part? Of it, it? it could we do it? We could possibly do it, yeah. but having Barnes, having our own hangar, having Hangar Two, which belongs to WTA, um, it, it it is the way to go. It's absolutely the way to go because, uh, I mean, the, the students get to see the airplanes. Um, they, they taxi airplanes. Um, we take them right through the emergency procedures and taxiing and right up to takeoff, and they have to do it a certain way. And so to do that in the parking lot here would, would be, be very, a little challenging. Yeah. Very challenging. <laughs> Plus, I would assume that an airport like Bradley is too busy with commercial traffic and, and cargo to be able to accommodate students. They, you know, they possibly could. They possibly could, uh, but it's not a training. It's it's not a training environment, and it's an international airport. You know, much like Westover. Westover, uh, you, as a pilot, you're not allowed to do touch and goes. You, if you're going to land there, you come in, land, stop. All right, touch and go for those of us who may not know what that means. So that is <laughs> just so, like so that is you get in the pattern around the airfield and. And, and you practice landing, and then you take off, and you circle back around, and you land again. And, and just touch the landing gear down. Sometimes it's full stop. It depends if you're asking for the option. You know, it, you, you're communicating with the tower the entire time, and, uh, and uh, they don't want you doing that. They want, <laughs> you to, they want you to land, taxi to where you're going, shut the airplane down, get out and go home. Uh, yeah. Here at Barnes, yeah. we can go around and around and around and around, and you see it all the time. You see little airplanes just circling and circling and circling, and, and that's in practicing. We only got a minute here, but let's we'll start with Owen. Mm. Owen, what if, if somebody were going to talk to you and say, hey, I want to do this kind of program, what would you advise them? How should they be prepared to start an aviation program? You should definitely study. I mean, they'll give you the materials to study for the program and whatnot. You should... Um, obviously keep your academic grades good. That's very important, especially if you want to do college afterwards. Take notes, as yeah. you said. <laughs> and Taylor, what about you? Um, I'd definitely tell them to pay attention in class and take your notes and read your textbook. And definitely having good grades outside of shop is also helpful because if you don't have the best academic grades, I don't know if you'd be able to stay in the shop either. Because the shop is harder than academics. Really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess that makes sense. No, uh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you're learning technical stuff, you know, that is really a lot of it. And I've seen some of the work that you are doing. It's well beyond the high school math that I took, I, I, I can tell sure, you that. I'm sure it is. I mean, it, it is beyond my comprehension yeah. what you guys are studying or how an airplane works, even though I get on a plane a lot for work. I have no idea what's happening up front. I just know, I just know how to hold a tray without spilling a drink, which it doesn't really come in handy. I want to thank you guys for being here today. First of all, thank you to Stefan Saporowski, yeah. who's the superintendent of the Westfield Schools. And uh, uh, Stefan has a program here on Thursdays called Superintendent Spotlight. Galen Wilson, who runs the program at Westfield Technical Academy, and to Owen and Galen, who are two of the students. Um, I hope you come back again. I mean, half an hour just wasn't enough time. I would agree. We could talk about this for oh, hours. We love talking, we love talking about, about it. We'll do it again <laughs> later in the spring. That sounds okay. great. Maybe sounds we'll do great, it at Mark. the airport if we can bring our crew out to the hangar. Sure. We could do it right off there. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah. That would be a lot of fun. Can I, one last question for you. Is it cool to see the F-15s taken off every once in a while? Do you Absolutely. like Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. other planes, yeah, too? Yeah. 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 Good yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, it is and I love hanging out at Barnes. Anyway, uh, I want to thank all of you for being here, and we're going to take a break to acknowledge our underwriters, and we'll be back with more On the Mark. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. I'm Mark Auerbach. Don't go away.
Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Dunkin' Donut Shops of Westfield and the Sardinia family. It's nice to know that even as the world changes, Dunkin' Coffee remains the same at seven convenient locations throughout Westfield. Hi, it's Bob Plass, and I have Wow! It's Tuesday, every Tuesday, 6 to 8. Wow! It's Tuesday. Community Radio. 89.5 WSKB. I did it! <laughs> Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM, WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to On The Mark, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. If you've missed a part of today's programming or you want to watch it again or share it with friends, it's archived on YouTube under WSKB Community Radio. My next guest is a regular here. On, on the mark, and it's John Bidwell, who is with Wayfinders in Springfield, but also has been on this program because he's an author and a marketeer and a public relations person and a development person, kind of a renaissance man here in the Valley. And John and I were talking recently about this is the time of the year when we think about giving uh, making contributions. Giving Tuesday was recently, and people are, tend to be generous at the end of the year during the holiday season, but it's kind of short-lived, and the rest of the year we go on living our lives. And there are a lot of reasons to give and a lot of opportunities to give, and John and I were going to talk about that today. But first of all, it's good to see you, and for those of the people in the audience that don't know, you're affiliated with Wayfinders, which is located in Springfield. Can you tell us a little bit about Wayf what Wayfinders does? Yeah, well, first of all, good morning, Mark. It's wonderful to be back here. It's great to see you. And uh, Wayfinders is an affordable housing organization. It's the largest one in Massachusetts, uh, in Western Massachusetts. Um, we're involved with the continuum of housing. So that means that we do everything from getting people housed who are not housed, to keeping people housed, to providing education, um, to make sure that they stay housed, they understand what it takes to take care of a house, and as well as um, financial literacy. And uh, we work on projects both small and large. So some of the projects that we're working on right now could be 40 units and larger. And we want to just make sure that everybody across Western Massachusetts has the opportunity to find a home and to stay in their home. What's the big problem or the biggest problem in Massachusetts in getting people into homes? There aren't enough homes. And that's not um, particular to Massachusetts. That's really a nationwide issue right now. There simply is not enough housing. And what's happening in Western Massachusetts is because people can't find housing, they're moving out. So between the last census and the most current census, Massachusetts lost, I think, about 55,000 people. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but you really don't want a population to drop, especially in areas that can be more rural, like Western Massachusetts, because anytime you lose population, you lose support for local resources. And that could be everything from finding local volunteers for the fire department, to making sure that the uh, libraries stay open, to keeping hospitals open. So it was one of the reasons that Mary Lane Hospital, for instance, in Ware had to close. It can also mean that we lose representation in Congress. So if we don't have a high enough population, we lose that representation. It means we don't have as big a voice in Washington. So it, it's, an, is it, it's not an easily solvable problem, but an ongoing one that needs to be addressed. That's correct. I mean, this housing crisis that we're in right now, which has really reached a tipping point because everybody talks about it, has been developing for decades. And there's a lot of things that we can do to try to help people under these circumstances, like giving people vouchers to make sure that they can afford to stay in their rental units and, again, do the educational courses and the support services that we provide. But at the end of the day, what we need to do is to build more housing. We were part of doing a study last year that showed in Western Massachusetts alone, we had an 11th thousand unit um, deficit of housing and that that's going to spike to 19,000 by 2025. Hmm. We have a huge, huge need for housing across the board. How can you encourage developers and businesses to make more housing available? Yeah, that's a really good question. So part of it is we really need major investment. So for instance, and it's, it really comes down to funding for the most part. And that's where we need more help from the federal government and the state, because these are big projects. 
Um, there are other ways that organizations can help. For instance, this past Friday, we were able to secure a low interest loan from an organization which will allow us to take on more projects. Um, that low interest loan is for $500,000. So, you know, we do need larger chunks of money, but we also need smaller uh, monies as well because we do work on the federal and state level um, getting grants and having contracts. But we also have programs that operate with much smaller budgets that are used to support people. So any support is helpful it, from individuals. It can be donations. It can be a volunteer of time. Um, but from larger organizations, what we're really looking for is funding. And what are some of the pro I know right now you're on a uh, current campaign. Um, and what are you doing to let people know? And what kinds of things do you need as part of this campaign? So we're, uh, it, we're, yesterday was Giving Tuesday, as you mentioned, and I, so I hope everybody contributed to that. And if they didn't, feel free to have post-giving or Wednesday um, giving day. You can always jump in and donate to any organization that fits your mission, your personal mission. What we're doing right now is we're talking with as many people as possible to get them to understand the housing issue. What's interesting about housing right now is it's personal. Everybody I know <coughs> has a housing horror story. Everybody knows someone in their family who can't find a house, who can't find a rental unit. So people understand the need for housing, but they may not understand what to do next. How can they contribute to contri creating more housing? Yes, there could be financial giving, but a lot of it is also advocacy. It's understanding in your town, what are the laws that are in place for building or prohibiting um, or becoming a, a hindrance to building in your community? And you want to make sure that your, your town is well positioned, your city, to, um, to be more pro-development. And you want to make sure, of course, this is smart development, but you just need to make sure that there's some development going on. Housing right now, we are losing population. Uh, more housing means more people staying here, and that could include your parents, that could include your kids, that it could include um, nurses, that could include teachers in the community. We need people to stay in Western Mass. You deal with a lot of communities, large and small, in Western Massachusetts. What communities are doing the best uh, to move forward, and which areas of the state need help the most? Yeah, I'm not as familiar with the entire state, but in this area, most of our work has really been in Springfield and Holyoke. We also do a lot of work in Northampton and Amherst, and we have 24 sites that are scattered also um, in smaller towns in the area. So for instance, like Southampton. Um, what's interesting, of course, is that you can run up against individuals who don't want development in their community for a variety of reasons. But by educating a community and getting people to understand the advantages of housing and development, that can change. And Amherst is a wonderful example of that. So when we were first looking at some projects there, there was a lot of pushback as to what people thought affordable housing was. But through education and understanding the advantages of it, they've become much more of a, a pro-development community. And by that, I mean also smart. We're not talking about just any kind of development at, and at any cost. We're talking about development that fits with the community and that works for the community. When people talk about market rate housing versus affordable housing, can you define what those terms really mean? So um, affordable housing, uh, the, the way that I look at affordable housing is it's it can be, it covers a wide range. It can be everything from um, housing that is a starter home down to some kind of housing that in some ways is, is subsidized. So if something is um, market rate, it basically just means that, that the cost that is out there is not subsidized in any way, at least in an official way. Um, but when you're looking at affordable housing in some way or another, whether it's by the town, the state, or through federal contracts, that housing in some ways is subsidized. And Having housing subsidized is, is really necessary nowadays because the idea of what is a truly affordable home, in some ways, people argue, doesn't exist. Meaning that if it takes, on the average, four to $500,000 to build a home now, that is not something that's affordable to most people unless it's subsidized in some ways. And by subsidized, I'm talking about official subsidization, subsidizing through the state 
uh, for example, or through the federal government. I think it's important to remember as individuals, sometimes we are subsidized. So for instance, when my wife and I went to buy our house, it was subsidized by the support that we received from her parents. They helped, they gave us $20,000 for a down payment. And that's something that we in turn are trying to position ourselves for when our boys go to buy a house. Not everybody has that opportunity. Not everybody has that option. We wanna make sure that everybody has that. Building a home, having a home is integral to building generational wealth. That is the thing that gets a family not only housed, permanently housed, but can help future generations as well. And of course, the, the housing stock, I mean, if you, you buy a home now, you may outgrow it years from now and buy something bigger, but that initial house that you have could be very affordable to somebody starting out. Oh my gosh, that's so true. So I, when my parents moved from Connecticut up to New Hampshire, that's exactly what they did, right? They lived the American dream. They rented a tiny little house until they could afford a larger house, and then they were able to afford an even larger house. Those options were available to them. The problem now is that we don't even have the housing stock for people to enter the housing market. There aren't affordable homes. There aren't starter homes. One of the reasons for that is that Building homes is expensive. So most builders don't want to build small starter homes. They want to build larger homes that they can make more money from. And that's understandable from a business perspective. That's why it's all very important for organizations like Wayfinders and for municipalities and the state to invest in those starter homes to get people literally in the door and on track to that American dream. We have a lot of buildings that lay abandoned in the area. I mean, I see them in Springfield. I see them in Holyoke. How come they're not being converted into housing? Old factories, for example, old schools that are no longer used. In, in Longmeadow, there was an elementary school um, that closed as schools were being consolidated, and it was turned into condos as housing stock. How come mm -hmm. uh, some of these abandoned buildings aren't being rehabbed into uh, affordable housing? Well, some of them are, and it depends on the state of the building. So not uh, some buildings can be rehabbed and some can't. If a building really lies vacant for too long and there's too much damage, there's not really much you can do about it, um, especially if the roof goes. It's just, it's not worth it. But you do see the rehab that you're talking about. So for instance, in Hatfield, that the old school there was turned into condos. Right now, Holyoke has a huge project going on through the mill that's along the canal for senior housing. So those projects do happen. And you've also seen it in um, East Hampton, where some of the buildings there um, on Ferry Street are being converted both into residences and, and businesses. So those things are happening. However, the thing to remember is not every building is capable to be rehabbed. It wasn't, it, it may not be set up in a way or it may not be structurally safe to, to rehab. Some buildings just need to be raised at the end of the day and rebuilt from scratch. You gotta remember too that New England has some of the oldest housing stock in the country. Um, I think on average housing around here, some of the buildings are 70 years old. Um, they, there's a lot of issues with asbestos. Um, there's building codes that can't be met. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, a lot of buildings need to be torn down and rebuilt. Yeah, that's a, that's a sad state. Both of us are involved in uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, my public relations company works with groups, for example, arts organizations and small media companies. You're working with Wayfinders, but your resume includes, you know, all kinds of uh, nonprofits along the way. Why do you give? What makes you want to give back to the community? I know for me, there's a great deal of satisfaction in doing something for the greater good because the greater good has done something for me. I agree. I think it's payback to, is a lot of it, to be honest. I've been very fortunate to grow up in the communities that I grew up in and the families that I grew up in. And they also set an example for me. I've been very lucky that there have been people in my family that have set a wonderful example of service. Um, I think of my grandfather, for instance, um, and my grandmother, who volunteered a lot to the Red Cross. They, they volunteered for the local fire department. Um, they raised money for different causes. Um, both my parents were involved with local town politics. My stepfather was very involved in his town up in Maine, including driving to the north of Maine to <laughs> to get a, a pickup full of potatoes to bring back for those who couldn't afford food around the holidays. So part of it is an example. I think part of it is a payback. It's a recognition for, for what you have in life. But it also, frankly, makes me feel good. Um, so I know that I, I feel like I'm a better person by giving back because 
what's wonderful about giving back is you start to see the best in humanity, right? And and if we watch the news nowadays, news focuses on what's negative because negativity sells. It, that, that's just a reality. Um, it's, it's good to be aware of what's going on in the world, but when all you're absorbing is that negative energy and that negative news, it's going to take an impact on you. One of the things that's wonderful about giving back is you start to see the best side of humanity, and it's going on all the time, all around us. It may not make the news, but it's there, and you can get involved at any time. Yeah, and I think that um, we all have a responsibility as good citizens to make our community better in whatever way that we can, whether it's a financial contribution uh, to an effort or volunteering of one's time and energy, or if you're a business donating product uh, to, to the community in one level or another in the area that interests you really makes the community better. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, I'm just like, how did you get involved with giving back, Mark? Well, my parents were philanthropists uh, to the extent that they could give money. And I knew that they were involved in causes that were dear to them. When I went to high school, we were taught to give on weekends, uh, either our time or our money. We'd go to chapel and they'd pass the plate. And the students would pick a, a project in the community, whether it was the homeless. I was interested at the time in helping um, at Franklin County Public Hospital, which is now Bay State Franklin Medical Center. And I volunteered two afternoons a week as what would be referred to as a candy striper, you know, bringing newspapers and flowers to patients and things like that. And it made me feel good. And so that's how it got ingrained in me. And then I worked with a bunch of nonprofits uh, before I started my own company. So I knew the importance of contributions and donations to those organizations, whether they were arts or public broadcasting. And you know that uh, your public radio and public TV stations are out there asking for money, along with everybody else. Giving Tuesday, my inbox was just full of requests for funds from all of them very good organizations. And I was, I'm able to support a few, and it makes me feel really good, and I feel accomplishment in doing it. I'm able to donate my time to a couple of organizations or consult with them on a pro bono basis. It feels good, it feels right, and it's a payback. Yeah, well, the beautiful thing about it, right, is it's not just anecdotal. It's not just you and me right now talking about how good it makes us feel. Scientists have done research into this and have and have seen that by being generous, it's one of the best things that you can literally do for your health. People who are generous um, are healthier, they live longer, they're less likely to get depressed. Basically, you get outside of yourself, and all of the research supports this. It was interesting, I, I read an, a, an interview that had been done with my grandfather recently, and one of the pieces of the interview was, you know, why do you give back so much with one of the projects he was doing? And he said, and he was 90 at the time, 91, he's like, because it gives my life purpose and meaning. And it, it gets me out of the bed every out of bed every day, and and I think that that's that's true. I think one of the reasons he he lived to the age of ninety three and he was as healthy and and did as well as he did up until the very end was because he had that continued purpose. It was a purpose that he sought. And the beautiful thing, I, I, I don't know if it's a beautiful thing, but the world has a lot of need, right? So it, it, what's beautiful is that if you want purpose, if you wanna connect, if you wanna bring your, your vision of what you want the world to be to life, it is really easy to do. I would love for everybody to give to Wayfinders, but what I really care about is that everybody gets out figures out what's most important to them and to gives and, and and gives back in accordance with that mission, even in small ways, because I can guarantee we're all going to benefit from it. You know, and I think about this, uh, we've been watching the headlines about Rosalind Carter and Jimmy Carter, and the fact that once Jimmy Carter left office, he became a major volunteer at Habitat for Humanity. And up until his 90s, he and Rosalind Carter were building housing for people. And it must have made them feel very good because they continued to do it. And they're just one of many volunteers and donors. And you don't have to give a million dollars to an organization to make a difference. But if 10 people give $10 to an organization, it does make a difference. 
It does. It's really e it's it's far too easy to think, wow, these problems are so big and what I can donate is so small. Right. But the reality is everyone gives a little bit and it really does become something larger. I saw that in particular at United Way. Right. Because United Way is made up of 50 you percent know, of all the donors are, are, are small, small donors. You want to see those small numbers coming together to create something bigger. Bang, that is a perfect example of that. And that's just one example, because that's true of all organizations, it's true of the food bank, it's true of the survival centers, it's true of us at Wayfinders. All of those little things add up to truly make a huge difference. <clears throat> and, you know, we grew up in an era, John, where the generation before us had philanthropists, where people could write large checks. When I came to Springfield to work at the Springfield Symphony and later on Stage West, and uh, WFCR, there were individuals that could write checks for thousands of dollars, and oftentimes they did. But that generation isn't here anymore. Um, they've aged out of major giving. So um, the the new generations may more people may give, but they're giving in smaller and smaller amounts because that's what they they can afford. And so we need to find new ways to get people engaged and involved in our nonprofits. Right, and I, I also want to stress that it doesn't have to be monetary too. I mean, it, it truly can, they, there are volunteer opportunities. There's also advocacy. So for instance, again, coming back to housing, because that just happens to be where I'm sitting at the moment, if we want to advance housing in the region, and I truly believe that we need to do that for a myriad of reasons, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because from an economic development standpoint, it's truly what's going to help our region in a lot of different ways, then we need to make sure that towns and areas understand the importance of it. So as an individual, you don't have to spend any money. You don't even have to volunteer your time for an organization. But if you do show up for what's going on in your town in terms of issues, let's say around housing, and you express a voice of understanding how important it is, even without understanding all the details, you're playing a really important role for everybody. Yeah, you can write a letter to a congressman or a senator or an elected representative. You can share the need with 10 or 15 other people that you know through networking, through e-blasts and stuff like that. So you don't have to actually be a cash contributor to an organization or a volunteer in terms of time. They always said that we all had an opportunity to participate in three ways. We could be a doer and get involved with the day-to-day -day operations. We could be a donor and write a check, or we could be a door opener and help that organization receive recognition or funding from another source. Right, right. And going back to your point before about having a voice, you, we live in an incredible area in terms of our legislative delegation. I, I think that I, I know most of them, they are a remarkable group, they are whip smart, they work together as a team, and they'll all tell you the same thing. They'll say they pay attention to the voices that come to them. If you write a letter, if you call the office of your representatives, I promise they will listen to it and they will make note of it and it, it will be acted on. That is, this is not a group that somehow at some lofty high place you can't get to. They are very accessible and your voice makes a big difference. And people should be, uh, do not be afraid to raise your voice and make your, your feelings known. Um, as you said, John, they listen. They do, they do. What's an example for you, Mark, that, that where, where, you, where you feel like you've made a big difference? Well, I've made a, a big difference to one organization in particular lately, and that's the musicians of the Springfield Symphony Orchestra. I came to Springfield to work at the symphony, and 40 years later, there was a labor disagreement between the musicians and the Springfield Symphony Orchestra. And the musicians formed their own nonprofit called MOSO, which has since changed its name to the Springfield Chamber Players, and they needed help marketing, promoting, and managing their concerts. I jumped in to volunteer because I knew the people, and I thought it would be a 12-hour commitment. It's been two and a half years, about probably 15 to 20 hours a week, but it is the most satisfying volunteer effort that I've done in my career because I'm helping people I know bring music to thousands of people. Yeah, that's that's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing what what we can do as individuals. Um, now, 
I thought you brought up a very interesting point where you thought it was going to take a shorter period of time and it took a longer period of time. That's that often happens, right? But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Anytime no, it's not a bad thing. I mean, um, I'm able to manage my business and my journalism and broadcast career, and there's still free time around it that I've been able to work with them. But I think that you know, when you get involved in an organization, I have a, a friend who volunteers at Dakin, the, anim the animal shelter, and said, I thought I'd go in two days a week or two afternoons a week and feed the kitties. And now it's just can't wait to be there and spends hours a week there. You know, it happens. Yeah. It does happen. And again, that's really good, right? It's good for our health. I just, I'm fascinated again by these studies that show how giving back really helps us as individuals. I suspect that one of the reasons it does is because it gets us outside of ourselves. You know, we live at a time where there's a lot of emphasis on me, me, me. I need my time. I need this. I need whatever. Now, that's not to say there isn't some truth to that in the sense that we all need some downtime from, you know, we want to rest, we want to recoup. But studies have shown that if you get outside of yourself and you start to care for things outside of yourself, you're going to be a happier person. You're less prone to depression. You are going to be increasing levels of oxytocin, which is that sort of cuddled chemical in your body and serotonin, which brings happiness. I mean, there are literally no downsides to giving. It's if there, if I was a doctor and if there was one prescription I could give to anybody who wanted to be happier in life, it's to give back. Here's your prescription. Go to town. Exactly. John, we only have a minute here. So tell people how they can get involved in Wayfinders um, this holiday season or beyond. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, you can go to wayfinders.org. There is a donate page there. Um, we've also been uh, raising money and collecting for a toy drive that we do. So we have about 500 plus um, children that are in our shelters. And every year we want to provide toys for those children in particular, because it's hard on the families to frankly have find the money to, to provide those gifts for their kids. So that's something that's really important to us. So wayfinders.org, go to the donate uh, donate section. We, we don't have a donut section the donate <laughs> section um and then you can also uh you can give through there to the toy fund thank you john bidwell thanks for being here today happy holidays to you yeah you too mark i look forward to seeing you again soon likewise and that wraps up on another edition of on the mark P peter coles has been our chief engineer i'm your host mark Auerbach. we'll see you next week with another edition of on the mark Christmas bright.